finds an area that he's going to bury it, you'll find he'll use that shovel-like head to dig the hole to be able to then put that ball inside. So they really are perfectly designed for the lifestyle that they lead. <clears throat> Kind of getting in his way a little bit here. I'm going to just get up and move so that he can be able to roll with ease. And now you can see with a bit of the sun on him how beautiful he actually is. Unfortunately for him, there's no female that's with him at the moment. Generally you find the female sitting on top of the ball and the male is the one that is busy rolling along and she kind of just waits until they get to the place and then deposits her larvae. So I don't know if he's just made this ball in the hope that a female will find him, but so far we haven't seen any sign of a female or any other dung beetle here. It's getting to that time of the year now where unfortunately the dung beetles are coming to the end of their season. You know, we've had good rains and so most of them would have bred already. Um, and it means that the population of them is probably quite low now because um, once they've bred most of them will then die off they're only around for the season and so he might be struggling to find a mate for his little ball isn't it incredible the amount of power that they've got So, Nimrod, you're asking what animal dung this belongs to. Difficult to say. Um, when we got here, it was already had a fully rolled ball like this. Um, but just to my right over here is a pile of impala dung. So, he could have harvested from impalas. I have seen them use impala middens before. Um, but there was another, a number of other animals here. We had some nyala, there was a wildebeest that went past us just now. Um, so, it could be any one of those. Difficult to say. I don't see any sign of any other dung that he could have harvested from close by. I'm sure if we looked around a little bit, we might find. But in all likelihood, it's probably just impala dung here. Um, they do utilize that, especially when it's fresh, it's easy to be able to mold it into this little ball. Oh, you see he's just fallen off, so I'm just going to write him before we go. There we go. Alright, and we're going to leave him to carry on with his rolling. It's a difficult task, that's for sure. He's, got to, he's going to have to get out of that little pit that he's in, which is going to take a bit of effort, that's for sure. You can see he's just kind of cleaning off all the bits of sand and keeping his ball in nice condition. And then he gets under and uses those front legs to be able to push. But like I say, it's going to take a lot of effort to get over that little verge. Even though for us it looks absolutely tiny, you can imagine for him it must be like a massive mountain that he's busy trying to push that ball over. And there we go, let's see if he makes it. Oh, almost. I always feel sorry for them when they push up over these big little, or well, these little ridges, and they uh, end up then falling down and the ball comes crashing back to you. All right, look at that, isn't that incredible? Can you imagine how much strength that must be taking to push that ball all the way through that grass? Louis, you're asking if this is home for this dung beetle? It isn't its home. Um, it's pushing this ball to an area where it's going to bury the ball. Now, normally what we find is that these dung beetles use pathways and open sections like roads to be able to roll the ball it's much easier as you can see there it's really tough to push it through the grass so they normally use open sections and then they roll across those open sections and once they get to a grassy area they'll then bury the ball in the gra the, the, the the soil and the reason why is that they are going to use that ball as a brood ball so there will be a larvae that will be inside there and that will feed off that dung so it's not actually its home it doesn't live inside there or on there it's only doing this just for breeding purposes um, when they're just flying around you'll find that they'll sit on branches and trees and things like that um, so yeah it's not its home it's just a breeding facility As you can see, just orientating himself again. We had a slight wobble when he went up there, so just making sure he's still on the right track. But I think he's going to have a tough time through this grass. Well, Tony, they do sometimes. You'll find that most of... Oh no, we've just failed. Unfortunately, the ball has gone rolling back to where we started. So little bit of an unfortunate incident and like I say I always feel so bad when they when this happens to them you can see now it's got to come back and all that effort to roll through that grass was just for nothing it's gonna to have to try do that all over again um, 
So do the females, are they attracted to the size of the ball? Yes they are, they, they like to see a male that has a much larger ball and the reason why is because that's going to be more food for the little egg um, or the larvae that's going to hatch inside there and feed off it. Um, so for them, they know that the bigger the ball, the more food, the safer it's probably going to be for that little one um, and, and the more successful that that little one should be. So. The females do go to larger, larger rolled balls. It also depends on the species. Some species roll much bigger than others. These um, plum colored ones that we see here, they roll quite big ones. This is actually quite a small ball for them. They often get m double or even three times as big as that. So the females are attracted to slightly bigger ones. Maybe that's why he doesn't have a female with him this morning. <laughs> Debbie, the largest dung beetle uh, well, the ball that a dung beetle has pushed. Um, I would have to say, probably, I'm just trying to give you a reference for a size, um, maybe a size of a grapefruit, um, so slightly bigger than an orange, I'd say about that size, which is pretty incredible. You can imagine for a beetle that size to be able to push something this big is incredible strength. It was quite amazing to watch that. Um, and that particular beetle pushed it all over the place and actually went quite far. We followed it for a while just because of the size of the ball. I wanted to see how far they went and it was incredible to watch how quickly they actually buried it. So once they found a tree that they wanted, they dug out and it took only probably about 10 minutes and the ball was down in the ground and they were covering up already. So pretty incredible. Um, they are amazing creatures and like I say, to push a ball that size is pretty incredible. But anyway, we're going to leave him on his way. Like I say, he's managed to negotiate that grassy section. So we're going to carry on. So James, um, with dung beetles, generally what happens is, is that the smell of the dung attracts both male and female. The females know that they're going to find the males there because the males, when they smell that dung, are going to arrive and they are going to start um, you know, rolling their balls. So the females generally there. Um, the males don't secrete a pheromone as far as I know um, once they are on the balls. Maybe there is, but as far as I know, I've never read anything about them secreting any pheromones um, or seen it in action. Generally what you see is when there's a fresh pile of dung, multiple dung beetles bombing in there, and then they meet there and then the female will go on top and the male then pushes the ball away. So I've never actually seen them secrete anything. Um, so no, I don't think that they do. It's mostly just the smell of the dung that attracts the community of dung beetles into that area. All right. All right, so we're going to carry on, um, see what else we can find on our walk, and while we do that, we're going to go across to James. Right, everybody, here we are with a serrated hinged terrapin. And it's quite a big one. I'm sitting next to it. It's not quite as big as me, of course, but I'm an unusually large human being. It's probably about, well, it's almost a foot long, you know. I'll just stand next to it. And I don't want to p pick it up for two reasons. Obviously, we don't want to stress it out. And the other reason is that they uh, make a very bad smell if you pick them up. Now, I have a UK size 7 shoe. And uh, this... Well, this this terrapin is, um, well, it's about a size 6 or so, I suppose. It's quite a lot wider than my shoe, though. Now, I don't know if you can see its eye. Can you see its eye there, Craig? Sort of. It's You can see it here how it's turned its head to the side to pull it into the shell. And that differentiates it, of course, from a tortoise which won't do that. A tortoise will pull its head straight back into the shell. This chap pulls his head sideways. You can see there, as I move the stick towards him, he pulls it sideways in. And he's called a serrated hinge. I'm going to turn him around for you so that you can see. I'm just going to just gently shift him in the sand. This will not hurt him at all. There are the serrations on the back of the shell. See that? That's why he's called serrated hinged. He's got quite a lot of mud on him. He's been in the mud. And these ones lived in much, live in much bigger water bodies than the little ones we find on the road, which are called marsh terrapins. His hinge I'm not going to be able to show you, but I'll show you where it is, because I'd have to flip him over to show it to you. The hinge is over here. 
underneath here on the plastron which is the underside and what it does is it closes the front legs and the head in so that it just makes that gap between the front legs and the head and the outside world that much smaller which in turn makes it more difficult for predators to get at so it's just under there I'll just turn him back towards you like that and you can see him there isn't he cool? He's a pretty big example, and I wonder if I haven't seen this very one in Bifelsuk Dam. We're just quite close to Bifelsuk Dam. Can you see this? Can you see this here, Craig? Oh. It was a pirate fly carrying some sort of insect. I initially thought it was a spider hanging from the tree, but it wasn't. It was a pirate fly having pirated something. Now, of course, pirate fly filming is, um, well, it's the most advanced kind of filming you can get, of course. If you are able to film a pirate fly in motion, you have achieved the ultimate, I feel, in, uh, in video making. Don't you think, Craig? Yeah, mm-hmm. Pirate fly. All right, on we go. We just came past Bifflesook Dam because there were indications that there might have been lion tracks heading this way from Bifflesook somewhere, but I didn't find any, I'm afraid. Righty, on we continue. We need to try and avoid our little terrapin friend who is very confiding to us. Oh, he's moving off now. With the same speed as his more commonly known friend, the tortoise. Come on, Terrapin. There we are. Come on. Move it along. Isn't he cool? He's thinking about moving, but he doesn't really know where he wants to move. There's so many options. Left, right, front back. And when your brain is the size of half a pea, those must be difficult, difficult decisions to make. <laughs> it's very ponderous, isn't it? That's a bit like Craig moves, you know. It's quite interesting. He's, of course, from Durban, which means he's almost as chilled out as that terrapin is. And that's about the same speed that Craig moves around the camp. <laughs> Craig, is that, do you feel at one with the terrapin? All it lacks is your slops. <laughs> All right, on we go. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Hang on. This an odd duck coming down here. It looks like a shoveler. Please land. There it is. Obviously flying into the sun, so it's utterly impossible to see. I'm just going to give it the opportunity to land. That, I, that's a shoveler. I think it's going to reject this dam out of hand and go elsewhere. Yep. That is precisely what it's done. Right, do you want to quickly see what that is? Do we need to go to Jamie or can I quickly have a look, Rebecca? Ah, we can look at the shoveler. Now, the shoveler has a beak that looks like a, Craig? Shovel. Correct, a shovel. And, I mean, it couldn't have been. A cape shoveler? No. No, you know what it wasn't, but I don't know what it was. I'm going to investigate what it was, and then, while I sort of embarrassingly try and figure out what that bird was. Why don't we head back across to Jamie and find out what's happening on Cheat Plains. Not much.
which is happening on a cheetah plains while we're out here. Um, but we have encountered something very interesting. So either a Tyrannosaurus rex walked through here a little bit earlier, which seems unlikely, I suppose. It would be exciting if it did, but unlikely. Or an elephant came and slept underneath the shade of the tree here. And you can actually see where the grass has been completely flattened and in some cases pushed up against the side of the tree. Doesn't that look like a really comfortable spot to curl up? I'm almost certain it's an elephant just because there are so many fresh elephant tracks on this road. Probably quite a young elephant as well that curled up and slept on its side. So elephants do sleep lying down. And actually this morning on our way through past the herd of elephants that James started with, there was one adult that was completely flat and out. She was fast asleep. Now I think that's what happened here. An elephant curled up. They, of course, don't have any homes to return to. They don't have a convenient mobile home like the terrapin that you were looking at with James. So they just have to curl up and sleep wherever they happen to. And I think that's what was what was occurring here. And my suspicion, even further, is that the head was on the right, sort of the top right of this hollow in the ground. Just from the way that this particular dent is shaped, I think that elephant was probably resting its head over there. Comfortable pillow. What a charming spot. Thick panicum grass. Perfect. Now we've got the shadow demonstrating exactly what the elephant would have looked like if it were sleeping in that hollow. Right, we're not going to spend too long because there's not really much more we can say about that. Sleepy, sleepy elephant. We might actually encounter them a little bit further on. Their tracks are everywhere, but we're right on the boundary between Kruger itself and Cheetah Plains. So they might have decided to wander into Kruger. Last time you saw me, I was following leopard tracks. They disappeared onto some very stony ground, but I suspect, because I, I followed them for a little bit, I suspect they've gone onto Nkoro. As to which leopard it was, I honestly couldn't say for certain. Oh, we're here already. Okay, well in that case, the vast open area of and Cheetah Plains clearing is just in front of us. No sign of the cheetah yet. I doubt he would have gone far though. They're still looking for each other. One is to the north, one is to the south. And the one to the south is around here. And I'm not sure, he can't quite decide. I don't think either of them can decide where to go. Imagine trying to find yourself. Oh, not yourself. <laughs> don't imagine trying to find yourself. It's a dark and dangerous pathway. I meant, imagine being a cheetah and trying to find the other half of your coalition. When you can't make too much of a noise, they don't roar like lions roar. And they don't really want to make too much sound as it is. And now they've got to try and locate each other in this vast wilderness. And they're only about... Their head sits only at about three feet high, a meter high, and the grass is long. Now they've got to try and reunite once again. It must be a very tricky process. But one that they shall accomplish, I have no doubt. I've seen Cheetah Brothers lose each other a few times, various coalitions over the years. They always come back together again. So there we go. The vast open area of Cheetah Plains clearing and Mala Mala. No sign of anything. Let's get to a slightly better position. Can't believe how much this place has changed. That grass is unbelievably long. Makes spotting cheetah a bit more tricky, doesn't it, Viam? I mean, if that cheetah's lying down there, in the shade somewhere, I don't know how we'd see it. We'd have to get really, really lucky. It is really beautiful though. Mm. Lovely morning. No wildebeests. There's one wildebeest. He's lying up in the shade ahead of me. I'm going up to him now. No ostrich. I haven't seen ostrich in a long time. A jackal would disappear into this grass as well. Oh, 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 pintailed wider. Oh dear. Where's it gonna land? Please land. It's gone very far away. Ah, no, oh, it hasn't landed. Okay, hold on everybody. I'm gonna try and catch the pintail wider. It could be my contribution to February's bird list. Ah, oh, I've lost it. Come back, come 
come back. Ah, I see it. Sit, stay. Ah, wow, Vim, well done. That was incredible. <laughs> it goes up and tailed wider with its ridiculously long tail and breeding plumage. I've lost track of where it is in real life. VM still got it. I can't see it. Oh, there it goes, into Mala Mala. Aww. <laughs> oh well. It was worth a try. Well done, VM. That's incredibly difficult to do. I mean, that little bird's only about this big. Okay, and with a tail, it's about that big. But it's still a very, very small bird. I will show you a picture of it in my book instead. But I'm going to show you the wildebeest while I try and search for the picture of it. Or have I terrified him by my mad race to try and get a pintail wider on camera? I'm sure I saw a wildebeest. Must be there. There we go. Hello, Gnormless. Stop there. I'll search for the picture of the pintailed wider quickly. And you can have a look at Gnormless Gnorm and the Gnu, whose arch rival was the, well, according to Brent, whose arch rival was the wildebeest that we saw earlier, Normal Norman. Pardon? The Nobbull ducks. Oh, yay! Comb ducks, oh. not bull ducks. Oh, no, no, not oh, false alarm. No. It's an Egyptian goose. <laughs> Almost, Vim. <VM. laughs> There's mud smudged all along his forehead. He does that for a very specific scent marking reason. He does that in order to transfer the scent marks or the, the scent marks? The scent from his scent glands around his eyes, his preorbital glands. This is the little pintailed wider that we were looking at. The females were around as well, fluttering about, but this is the male in full breeding plumage with a startling black and white colour, and then the red bull, and then the long pintail. Now, this is a bird that much like our cuckoo family, it also parasitizes nests. And you can imagine with a bird b that size, you have to go for a relatively similar sized bird. I mean, they're very, very tiny. So they parasitize the nests of things like wax balls. Here we go, forgot the word. Long -tail uh, they should parasitize long tail shrikes just for the, they'd be like Halloween, like they're dressed up in long tail shrike clothing. Bird just flew past me. And I don't know what it is. Oh, it's a lark. But it's gone into Mala Mala. Okay. Yes, pintailed widers go for. Unfortunately, they should go for magpie shrikes, but they don't. They parasitize the nests of wax bulls. And to leave normal, gnormless gnorman and go and search for these cheetah. I've seen lots of Ellie tracks and of course we saw the dent of that elephant sleeping. Seems as though James is having slightly more luck that with us than us. Than us. <laughs> with packy terms. I give up. <laughs> right, here we are with a herd of elephants. As Jamie said, we've had some luck with them. And this one, I thought initially was digging around in some old elephant dung, but he's not. He's found a pile of soil that he thinks is nice to throw on him. And it's underneath a marula tree. But I think this marula tree is a male. I don't think it's got fruits. No, it doesn't seem to have fruits. Anyway, we've got a lovely herd of elephants here. They're inside Torchwood which is the reserve to the east of where we are. There are the rest of them there. Just coming into view. Very peaceful, smaller than the herd we saw before. Probably only about six or seven of them. 
and slowly coming this way, which is nice. And the clouds have come over again, so the sun seems to have disappeared, which is really rather merciful. Now, I don't know how many of you were with us last summer during the well, what was only can only be described as sort of trying times at the centre of a neutron star. That's how hot it felt. We've had just the most gorgeous summer this year. Yes, there have been some hot days, but nothing like last year. I'm going to try and reverse very slightly because this little bull behind us is now quite close. I can't wait for the day that we have electric vehicles and I can just slide gently back as opposed to make a giant roaring sound every time we want to move. And there we go. He's not worried about us in the slightest. He's now found a female tree to stand underneath. And that means he's picking up marula fruits. Now, Laurie, we're looking at a young bull here, of course, and so the inevitable question is, at what stage does he come into must for the first time, and when will he mate for the first time? Those two events are normally very far apart from each other. He will come into must for the first time, probably uh, sort of a proto-must, around about... 17 years old and that'll be a very short period there'll be some heightened testosterone he probably won't even produce that uh, sort of dripping urine that they do produce when they're in must the full or the adult bulls so I think you'll find that round about 17 they'll start to experience the first sort of twinges if you like they'll only have their first full-blown must probably at around 25 to 30 years old and then they will actively seek out a female to try and mate with and it can be any time between that time, well, I mean, it could, it could be as probably as early as 20, but it's highly unlikely that an estrus female would A, accept a 20-year-old bull in an area like this, in a wild area where there are many big bulls around, and also it's highly unlikely that an estrus female wouldn't be tended by another bigger bull of at least sort of 35 years old. So you'll probably find 25 to 30 is the first time that they'll be able to mate, and it could be even later than that. Now this cow coming up to the right hand side here, Craig, sorry, while you zoomed in there, I think I recognize her. She's got uneven tusks, and her right tusk has got a very clear notch in it from where she's been breaking grass and twigs over the course of years. And I think I've seen her in this very position before. Now those notches are not uncommon, but that one is quite distinctive. So I'm pretty sure I know who she is. Well, she doesn't have a name. And to call a female animal notch tooth. It's just not very nice. Hmm. And then, sorry, I'm Craig, I'm going to hack you again off to the left there. One of them seems to be just seeking the comforts of mum, having a little bit of a suckle kind of eat on the hoof or drink on the hoof right, these chaps are heading off towards the north and I'm just going to while we look at them explain to you that I, I, it wasn't a shoveler that we saw there's one shoveler that has a distribution in this area that's the Cape Shoveler. It could extend this far north. It's highly unlikely. And I just, uh, you know, it was so silhouetted that I think the only thing it could have been was a juvenile spurwing goose. So I'll show you the picture here and then I'm just going to open them up 
in the bird app as well so that we can have a look at more than one source of pictures. What I saw was that it didn't look big enough for me to be a spurwing goose. My initial thought was spurwing goose, but then otherwise too small. But it may have been a youngster. Now, I know that they achieve adult mass pretty quickly, but I'm pretty sure that it was one of these. There's the youngster. I just saw that red face and red leg or pinkish legs, and I did see a little bit of white on the front. So I'm going to go with juvenile spurwing goose on that one. And then I'm just going to go to the bird app and just have a look at those birds as well. Goose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know what? There's quite a nice one of them in flight here that I'll show you. If I can just find a better one. No. Okay. Craig, this is going to be a challenge. Uh, I kid you not. Might have a look there. So there on the top is what I think I saw in sort of silhouette. Alrighty, Jamie has got something that makes most people out here more terrified than anything else in the world. Well, at the moment, the thing that makes most people terrified looks terrified itself. I'm not quite sure. It's a very exciting find that we've just stumbled upon, but I'm not quite sure what's going on with this particular snake. I think we've just come across a very young mamba. Although... I haven't had a proper chance to see it. it. was flattening its head. It's got a bulge in the middle of it. So it's obviously recently swallowed something. And of course, snakes can swallow absolutely enormous meals. It's moving very slowly. I'm just going to... I'm going to get out of the car. I'm going to do so very carefully until I'm certain that it, it, whether it is or it is not a mamba. They can be quite aggressive snakes, and they're very, very fast. It looks a lot like one to me. A young one. Sorry, duck in front of you. But it was behaving very strangely in the beginning. It was sort of gulping and flattening its head, and it didn't look very healthy at all, but it seems to be okay now. Here we go, now it's moving properly. Wow. That was really very interesting. I wonder if it was just in the process of swallowing. Although that bulge is quite far down. Here it goes, sliding off into the grasses. Beautiful snake, but a very, very young one. Please don't. I'll just goes to show, they've got this reputation as being unbelievably aggressive snakes. But all snakes out here, I mean, 90% of bites that happen, happen because people are playing with them. People who don't know what they're doing are trying to catch them or handle them or remove them in some way. And snakes are not naturally aggressive creatures. Half the time they are more terrified of you than you are of them. And you can see that from the way that that snake moved off. And I don't want to follow it any further because if you frighten snakes that have just had a meal, they regurgitate whatever it is they've eaten. I don't want to frighten it anymore. I just wanted to make sure that it was okay, actually. I was curious to see why it was. It was sort of flattening its head and gulping. But the meal was, the bulge in its belly was already down towards its tail. Maybe we just came upon it after it had swallowed, but I'm not sure. Very interesting behavior. But it does just go to show that as though, although many people are terrified of snakes, and to an extent it's a rational fear, because something like a mamba could kill you, but half the time, or all of the time, all they want to do is just get away from you, move away from you, and be as far away and in the safest possible space as possible, well, safest possible space. Now, I said it's a young meter, a young meter, a young mamba. Mambas grow about a meter in their first year. So in their, in their initial stages, they're very, very tiny, no control over their venom glands, which is why handling a baby snake is a terrible idea because they still have venom that is as potent as the adults but they don't have control over their venom glands so a lot of the time a mumble will inflict what's known as a dry bite so it's just a threatening bite and no venom is injected but a baby mumba can't no baby venom snake 
can do that. They can't control. They just, when they bite, venom comes out. They have to learn that, that control. So never think that just because a snake is small, it isn't dangerous. It absolutely is. And that's why I think this is a young mamba. Hasn't had a chance to grow properly yet. And take about a year to get to a meter. They're very rapid growing snakes. Another year it will be two meters. And from then on the growth slows down slightly. And you see, then you get your three and your four meter long mambas amazing creatures. Just realized there's an elephant over there. <laughs> Missed it the first time round. Here he is. Hello boy. Hiding on Mala Mala. Nice big bull. He watching me look at snakes. The reason I actually came back all the way along here was to go and check on some lion tracks. So I th uh, It looks as though a big male lion crossed over into Mala Mala. I don't know which ones. The tracks go come all the way along here and he hasn't he's not resting in the shade anywhere so he must have gone on to Mala Mala. Uh, Holly you want to know how big that mamba can get? Uh, well over three meters is the answer. That, that's close to nine feet in length and when they get to that size then they're about that, oh, don't exaggerate Jamie, they're about that thick. They're about at their maximum they can be close to the, the sort of size of a tennis ball in terms of their girth. So they do get particularly large and of course what has led to a mamba's reputation as being fearsomely aggressive is, and I don't want to by the way, I don't want to follow the snake anymore just in case it does feel the need to regurgitate its food. The amazing thing about black mambas is that they can lift most of their body off the ground and they do something known as a body slam and that's to just try and scare you away. It's not to show aggression, it's to tell you to leave it alone. Now that of course is something that one would not want to encounter on a bushwalk. Let's go and find out what Tristan is looking to encounter. Indeed we wouldn't Jamie. I'm not a huge fan of black mambas and I suppose on bushwalk it actually wouldn't be too bad. They generally are not as aggressive as everyone makes them out to be. Most of the time if you're walking along you'll kind of not have too many issues. But as you can see we have got our own little reptile here. So we have a little lizard that is beautifully camouflaging amongst this broken bark that's on the edge of a fallen over tree. And this little guy, we were sitting here watching some caterpillars and this little guy has come out and has kind of befriended us, is sitting right next to us um, and has been fidgeting about in these broken little bits of bark and is looking for any signs of, I suppose, little grubs and insects. There was a leaf that blew in and I think it thought it was a buffalo, I mean a butterfly, because it grabbed the, the leaf. It would be quite impressive if it was a buffalo and it grabbed it. I don't think we'd be sitting so close either. But uh, it was a little leaf that blew in and it grabbed the leaf and with disgust spat it out again and then carried on about its business. But isn't that absolutely beautiful? Perfect camouflage as well. You can see those kind of browns and stripes just help break up the outline make it quite difficult to see. If you were coming past here quite quickly you wouldn't have noticed that little guy at all. So really really good camouflage. And fallen over trees like this really are the best place for these guys. There's lots of little crevices that they can hide in should a predator come. But they also have huge amounts of food available to them because there will be lots of little boring insects and the likes in there for it to feed on. So perfect little place. Now while we were sitting here with this little lizard we also managed to see a tick on a piece of grass. So I've got this little bit of finger grass here and you can see right there is a red-legged tick. Alright so this is quite a small one um, and these guys are the ones that we're really battling with at the moment. Um, we've been talking about it quite a few times in the camp about how the ticks have been really really bad. Now ones of this size are not too bad because we can see them. It's the larvae for these guys that are, we call pepper ticks that are a real big problem. But this particular species of tick is a two-stage life cycle tick. So what's probably happened is this one is was born, it's then jumped onto a host which they usually target small mammals so things like dikers, um, impala lamb, and they will have fed off that. Once they've fed to the point where they are quite full they'll then drop off and they will then go through a molting stage where they will get their eight set of legs as well as more advanced mouth parts and their breeding um, parts of their body. And so from there they'll then find another host that they go up and feed on that host. Um, on that host they will also find other ticks where they can then breed um, and they will drop off eventually and then lay their eggs 
drop off eventually and then lay their eggs for the next lot. But pretty incredible. Just shows to show you why they're so tough to see. Now had I put my leg there or my hand, we can try and just see if I put my finger here and just see if it will actually latch on. They sometimes do, no, this one is stuck firmly. Sometimes when they sense the heat, so sometimes when they sense the heat they'll kind of crawl onto you but this one is not doing it at all. Rob, you've raised an interesting question. Have I ever used sap from khaki boss to, to get rid of ticks? I actually haven't. That's the first time I've heard of it and I've tried many different things. I unfortunately am very prone to being bitten by ticks so I've never actually heard of anybody using the sap from a khaki boss. Um, I've used citronella, um, I've used lots of different insect repellents and none of them actually really work particularly well so I will give that a bash and see we'll see how it goes I'll try and find some khaki boss and try and find that oil and see if it does repel them and we'll keep you updated on that but yeah I've never heard of it and it would be interesting to see if it does work anything to get rid of ticks would be really really nice um, like I was saying earlier while we were sitting with this lizard we were actually well, we, while we were here We were watching some caterpillars and that lizard arrived So these little caterpillars seem to be having an absolute feast today. They are all on this bush willow over here So Jandre if you come around this side of things going to be your best bet, but inside here You can see they've all congregated together so there they all are, and they are absolutely mowing through this bush willow. You can see they've stripped that leaf absolutely perfectly, and they've now started on the other one. You can see the little bite marks as they've gone. And the reason why they're sticking together in a clump like this is just for safety. So they are obviously aware that they can be picked off. We actually were watching two starlings just now in a different bush willow trying to grab a caterpillar and so they know that the starlings and the birds are on a lookout for these guys. You can see they actually don't have too much hair on them so they don't have those irritating hairs that will cause you to itch so they don't have too much of a defense. So if they form a big group like this it means that it's a much bigger unit it makes it much more difficult for a predator to come here. A predator just sees that big mass together and thinks that it's a little bit too large for them to be able to go after and leaves them alone. So quite a clever strategy. Um, but I just see that before they were actually quite spread out. I think with us standing around and a couple birds flying around, I think they've all come together and bunched up. I don't see any more on the fringes. Oh, in fact they are. Yeah, they all are. So the rest of them are all kind of up and down this branch over here. Pretty incredible, eh? You can also see these guys are having an absolute field day of hiding underneath this leaf. So if you had to approach from the other side there, you would not see these at all. They've all packed themselves onto this leaf from behind and I'm sure they'll actually start to feed there but this will be a protection or a way of hiding and camouflaging. If you're on the underside of the leaf, if any bird of, that comes flying over is not going to be able to see you at all. So very clever strategy that. Quite impressed with these caterpillars showing a bit of initiative. All right well that's a little myriad of things all here together. It's pretty Awesome. We had this little knobthorn tree and everything was kind of around us, so really, really nice. Well, we're going to carry on and we're going to see what James is up to. I believe he's gone to Chitwa, so hopefully there'll be something at the dam. Well, James is sitting at Chitwa and peering into a, an area of the dam where I think the little, there it is, the little baby is up and down. Let's just keep looking there. Now, Brent reckons that that thing was born a couple of hours before our last TV show. Even if that isn't quite the truth, and I've no reason to doubt it, it is a very small hippopotamus, and it's not quite standing on its mother's back, but it's certainly using her as a sort of... Um, well, I mean, it keeps putting its front legs on the back. Now. The interesting thing about this is that there was some concern after the TV show that the, there's a little thing that the little hippopotamus was going to drown because Brent said I thought he was fairly clear about it but he said that he or he made a comment about it sort of sinking into the water and that it needs its mother and everyone was desperately worried that its mother didn't know what she was doing she was going to drown the th poor thing it's not that they it, they can't swim, but they're very buoyant. 
and they hit the ground and then they bounce back up again, they jump back up again and they put their front legs on their mother's backs and there they wait a while, take a breath and then sink down to the bottom again and they do that almost from, in fact, absolutely from birth. There's a little thing now. And it's not standing on its mother's back so much as leaning on her back. Isn't that nice? That's very cool. And it's actually not as deep as you might think there. I've looked at that area from the top of the dam wall and it's much, it's probably only about three feet deep in that particular area. And those hippos are all lying down on the bottom. They're not all standing upright. I think it gets much deeper towards the middle of the water. But well, that's pretty shallow there. You can see just kind of using mum's back as a bit of a support. And they do suckle underwater as well, do hippo. So that's what could be going on there. Well, not over that region. Oh, look at that. That is very sweet. That is a tiny, tiny hippopotamus. <laughs> Now standing on its back legs. So it's standing on the back legs, they're leaning on mum and now sinking down. And there's nothing to worry about there that's entirely normal for a hippopotamus. There's one of the bulls making a call. And while mum is very relaxed there, she's looking at us, assessing us as a threat. Because the major threat, of course, to a little hippopotamus like that would be a beastly crocodilian. And there is one. I saw it earlier. I don't know if it's still there. No, it seems to have moved. And as James Richard has said, it would be perfect to see a crocodile today to finish off the reptilian morning that we've had. Well, there is one here and I've no doubt it will show its dastardly face sometime soon. I find it very difficult to feel affection for crocodiles for some reason. Hello Jockey, a very good question. Oh, we want to know if hippopotamus are born inside or out of the water. Jockey, they are built, they're born normally in very shallow water or just out of it. So they're not born into deep water like they're in now. She'll normally find a sort of secluded lee in which she can come and, and give birth. And I have seen them being given birth to outside of water. So in a sort of a shaded, cool drainage line. It's just easier, I think. I don't think giving birth in the water is a particularly easy activity at all. Hello Barbara, you're in, all the way in Texas and as I said, yes, they do indeed um, nurse or suckle under the water and they do that, I, I don't know how they do it, I guess they've just got very sophisticated lips really, but yes, they do suckle under the water. I suspect they probably also suckle outside of the water at night. I don't think they have to suckle in the water, but when you consider the amount of time that mum spends in the water, you'd imagine they'd starve to death pretty quickly, unless they did eat under the water as well. Hmm. Now, we're wondering, of course, about these hippo and how or when they leave the water. And do you want to know do they migrate at all? They leave the water dough for supper at night. They come out and they eat grass during the night, uh, sometimes for many hours at a time. Migrate? No, not necessarily, not in the way we think of migration like the wildebeest migrate, but they certainly can move. 
and I think about 50 kilometers is about the limit that they're able to move. That's a long way, of course, it's about 35 miles. They'll move between water points if they have to. And I mean, this is permanent water. There is water down on the Sand River, but when all of the dams dried up on Juma, you know, there used to be two hippos that lived in Biffleshook Dam. There was one that used to live around the Juma Dam. There have been them, they have been seen in Twin Dams and in, in Treehouse Dam, but they all had to move. And eventually they moved to places like Sydney's Dam, then Sydney's Dam dried out, and so they have to move, otherwise they die. And eventually they do die in drought years but they'll find themselves getting closer and closer to the main permanent water sources, which are normally the perennial rivers that flow through areas like this. David, as we watched a little ox pecker there on, <laughs> on an island of Hippo, you say, does the baby stay in the water when the mum goes out to feed for safety? No, no. No, the baby will stay with mum all the time. And they are vulnerable at night when they leave the water. Of course, because lions and hyenas would definitely try and take a baby hippo if they could. But a hippo car is a formidable, formidable thing. And it would take a very, very brave lion to try and take on a hippopotamus cow and the rest of the pod. Sorry, Dave, I'm going to ask you to just swing across to the left, if you don't mind. Look at that fish eagle. Now, Winter Prism, we're going to go across and look at that fish eagle, which is sitting there with its wings out. That's really quite interesting. I don't think I've seen that happen before. I suspect it got wet, and it's hanging there like that to dry out a bit and just realign the feathers. Oh, and there are also a whole lot of elephants walking across the clearings. It's very nice. Winter Prism, you want to know if adult hippos are a threat to baby hippos? I suspect unrelated bull hippopotamus are definitely a threat to young hippos that do not belong to them. In much the same way as male lions are to young leopard cubs, at least young lion cubs. There, go a herd, there goes a herd of elephant across this clearing. Very nice to see. The fish eagle has now folded its wings. was we really have had a, a bumper elephant morning. Hmm. Right, let's have one last look at the hippo Potomai and then we'll head back across to Tristan who has got we do indeed it is a beautiful beautiful garden orb web I'm so excited to see these this is the first one that I've actually seen this summer they've been so few and far between generally we actually see quite a few of them and there should be a lot of the golden orb web spiders as well but unfortunately with the drought it seems that a lot of them disappeared um, and we haven't seen too many at all. So really, really nice to see this one. This one has been moving around quite a bit on the ground. I think it's busy trying to find a place to, to do its web. Often they will like areas like this where there's a lot of dense brush and then there will be a game path that will kind of cut through that area. And that's generally where they like to build the web. They like to build it across a game path because they know as animals move through that game path they're going to disturb insects which is going to chase things like grasshoppers up into their web and they can catch them. Also, when you have game paths you'll find that birds will fly sometimes along that because it's sort of channels that go through the bush and these guys have webs that are really strong enough to catch birds so you find sometimes small little birds like cysticulars or um, little sparrows they get caught up in the web and the spider will feed off it. But you can see the colors are absolutely incredible. It's got these bright yellow and blacks with these banded legs. And so the reason they have that is because generally the spider sits on its web. And so it's showing those colors to warn everybody that I am not tasty in any way. 
do not try and eat me. Um, I'm not something that wants to be consumed. Um, I've also got some venom on me, so it's not something you want to go near. Um, now this particular one is a big, big female. The females grow much, much larger than the males and are far more brightly colored. The males tend to be quite small and very nondescript. And you'll generally won't see too many of the males unless the female builds a beautiful big web and that's when the, the males often then come and join. But you can see it's not easy to negotiate through this grass when you've got eight massive legs. She's kind of trying to find her way through. Amazing, absolutely beautiful. And these guys, this garden orb, they really have quite a beautiful web. When they spin it, they'll often spin this big, thick, white silk in the middle of it. It's called a stabilimentum, and the reason they do that is also, again, just to serve as a, a way of showing animals that there is a web here and not to disturb it. So there's this big, like, white cross that they often do in the middle of the web, and it stands out. So it means that bigger animals, things like elephants and buffalo and those kind of things, can see that and then not go through the web and break it. So that's why they do it. The, guard, uh, the golden orb webs, they don't do it nearly as much as these guys. These guys are the ones that really build those quite prominent X's in their nest or in their, in their web. All right, but we're going to leave her be. Um, if she is busy trying to spin a web, I don't want to be standing in the way and end up breaking it in any way. Um, it takes a lot of time and a lot of energy for them to do it. It's also at the end of the day, the silk is a protein, so it's, it, it's nutrients. Um, it's nutrients that are, are utilized by the spider and so if you break the web it's obviously taking away from that spider so we're trying not to break anything here so we'll probably carry on Dawson you've asked if um, I can spell the name for the spider so it's garden g-a-r-d-e-n orb o-r-b and then just spider so you should be able to find it like that or if you just go on orb spiders there's a multitude of different species so o-r-b is the name very, very pretty, and I'm super glad. It would have been really nice to have found her with, an, with her web, because the webs are so intricate and beautiful, and they generally are really, really large. Sometimes you'll come across webs that will stretch across these kind of pathways that we're talking about here, and that's what I was saying earlier, is they'll often build on areas like this, and that's maybe why she's here. She's going to utilize that section to where we just came from, and come across and build this huge web across this area, and then anything that moves around here will disturb things up into her web. So a really good place that she's chosen. This is ideal habitat for one of the orb webs. Um, like I say, I'm hoping that this is a sign that we might start to see more of the golden orb webs. They are my favorite spider. Absolutely beautiful and the web itself has these beautiful gold strands which are really, really quite something. So I'm really hoping that they'll come out a little bit more. It is getting a bit late for them. We should have already seen them by now so I don't think we're going to get too many this year again. But hopefully now that we've had a bit of rain, by next year the, the numbers will start going up again and we'll start to see a lot more of them. All right, so we've still been in the area where we had those alarm calls, but so far nothing. We haven't had any signs of um, leopard or lions or anything like that. It's quite interesting is actually, if you have a look here, there is some husks from a millipede. So this millipede was obviously eaten. Um, it could have been anything at this stage. It's so kind of decayed. There's no tracks that are left here. But just judging by the pieces that are left, I would probably say that this was something like a civet. Um, this is generally what uh, goes after them and leaves it like this. They'll break up little bits and then they leave it. If it was something like a scorpion, you wouldn't find it exposed in the open like this. Scorpions, when they hunt the millipedes, they generally drag them under things. So you'll find like under rocks or under um, bark. That's where you find it if it's a scorpion. So I'm pretty sure that was a millipede that got eaten by a civet, which is obviously like a small cat or raccoon. Um, so pretty cool little animal as well. Unfortunately, they're only really active at night, so we see very little of them, find lots of tracks, and they are quite common here, but just very, very little is actually seen of them. Right, so like I was saying, there's been no sign of any um, leopard or lions that would have caused this alarm calling that we had earlier. Um, I did find one track for Tingana from yesterday, um, but it was from this mor yesterday morning when he was around the camp and then went out um, to the west. So no further signs of him. But there was definitely something that was upsetting the monkeys quite heavily.
So I'm just having a look around just to see if there's any signs of anything. There's really nice trees around here that often have lots of interesting little creepy crawlies on them. And one of the trees that we have right here is not something that I can see anything on, but it is a very, very interesting tree. This is a tree is called a buffalo thorn, um, and the reason where it gets its name from is if you actually have a look at the thorns themselves, you'll find that one thorn is very, very straight, and then another thorn is hooked, much like that of a buffalo's horn, and that's where it's come from. And this little tree in Afrikaans, which is one of the local languages in South Africa, is called a wachabiki. Now, wach means weight, and biki means a little bit, and it refers to the way that when you walk past this tree, if you're not careful, it's going to hook onto you, and you're going to spend some time there picking it off and making yourself free from this tree. So not a nice tree to deal with if you're having to walk around, but quite an interesting one from a local sort of point of view. They use it for quite a number of things. Um, the leaf of this um, particular tree, they will often eat that, so they either use it as a salad substitute or they'll cook it um, and boil it and then eat it. Um, it also produces a little fruit, which at the moment I haven't seen too many of, but there were a few months ago, we saw quite a lot of fruits on them, and those fruits will be picked and dried and then ground down, and they use it as a coffee substitute. I have tasted it, it does not taste anything like coffee, and it is not for me, it is vile, but some people say it's not too bad and they will actually utilize it so from that point of view it's a really good foods item um, and then what they will use it for is also when they have deaths in the families so you'll find in a time when somebody has died particularly if they died far away from their home what they will do is they'll cut one of these branches and they'll go to wherever that person died and they believe that with this branch they're able to then capture the spirit and bring that spirit back to where they're going to bury their deceased. Um, once they've done that, they come back, they will have a whole big funeral ceremony, and they will then bury that branch with the body itself, um, and then they place a branch on top of the coffin. Now, the reason why they do that is because they say that the branch of a buffalo thorn represents somebody's life. So you will have the th branch, I don't know if you can see here, it goes in a wave, so it does like this, a zigzag pattern, and so they say that represents the ups and downs in life. And so it represents where we've had good times and bad times. And then the thorns, they will make sure that the straight thorn is pointing up, which means that they're saying that their body or their spirit is going to go to heaven. And then the other thorn points downwards, so they're returning their body to the ground. So quite an interesting tree. And like I say, it really is utilized quite a bit by the local communities in this area. If you were a ranger and you've had to do a bit of bush clearing in your time, this tree is not your friend though. It's uh, uh, not a very pleasant tree to work with. You end up getting cut up completely from it. So not something that you want the elephants to push over the road. So we're busy walking along following a little drainage line on our right hand side here. The drainage line is really a great place for things like leopard to spend a lot of time and so if there are monkeys alarm calling, checking in places like this is really the best place to go. Um, they will like these kind of areas because they can hide very very well so moving around in that little riverbed system will mean that they are quite well hidden and very difficult for anything to see them. Also lots of big trees and shady trees and so the perfect place to rest up. The clouds have just started coming in now and so it's starting to get a little bit cooler but as the day goes on it will probably be quite warm by this afternoon and so here is a great place to find shade and to rest up for the day. So we are still busy with our bird challenge and there really are a lot of birds calling around here. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Um, but we've been battling to get them on camera. On foot is a little bit different to the cars. The birds generally see you from a little bit further away and they take flight. So it's been a bit tough to find them. Um, but I have seen quite a few birds this morning. There's been lots that have been calling. But unfortunately the calling birds don't count for this challenge. We have to get them on camera. So I'm hoping that some of the birds will start to come out as it's warmed up a little bit now. And we'll start to get them on these kind of treed areas, especially these open trees find that when you're walking you often get followed by a few different types of birds we 
sometimes get things like rattling cysticulars that will rattle away as we walk and make quite a bit of noise. Um, there's also the puffback shrikes that have seemed to have been following us this morning. They've also been calling quite a bit, but unfortunately we just can't get them on camera. Now, what we do have is something quite interesting. We have a big skeleton for a buffalo. Alright, so you can see this is quite an incredible skeleton. Um, pretty much the whole skeleton is here and this would be indicative of an animal that died of drought. Alright, this is not an animal that has been killed by any predator. The reason why we know that is just because of the way that this animal is lying. You can see the bones are all pretty much intact and all nice and close together. So what's happened is if this was a predator, the bones would have been pulled all over the place as things like lions and hyenas and vultures came in here, bits would have been separated all over. Um, but this would have been from a drought, the animal would have died and then it would have just rotted away. Now when we had the drought this year, the problem was there were so many of these animals dead like this that there literally wasn't enough predators or scavengers like vultures and hyenas to actually clean everything up. And so it's allowed us to be able to see these full skeletons which is really unusual. And what you can actually see, which is very very interesting, is the animal died and this big pile that you see here is actually the stomach content from that buffalo. Alright, so that is where the buffalo's um, grass was, that was all of what it had inside it and as it died this kind of pile of grass just stayed here. So it's really quite an interesting specimen this. Um, generally with these, like I say, you would never see this. This would be all scattered all over the place, so really quite an incredible sighting. I actually can see even one of the hooves are here, and you can see the bones for the toes are actually still inside, which is really quite incredible. Mole, since we're talking about drought and, and the way it's affected the animals, this year with the drought, the buffalo were actually the ones that were affected the most. So what happened was with the buffalo is that unfortunately with them being grazers, we lost all of our ground cover and it became very difficult for them to find nutrient rich grass. They're a little bit different from the, the rhinos and the zebras and, and those animals that have a hind gut fermentation. Those animals don't require high quality grass. They only, um, they'll be pretty much all right with any kind of grass as long as they can get some sort of bulk inside them, they'll process the nutrients. And so if they can't find enough grass they just move until they can. With these guys they actually require a nutrient rich grass and so that was all gone and so they lost condition very very badly. Most of the buffalo in this area are also infected with TB so that would have compromised their immune system and then when we had the rains um, the first flush of grass that came through was very nutrient rich and these buffalo then went and fed on it and the problem with that was because of the weakened system that they had because of the TB and the drought it basically was like eating food that was too rich for them and they got diarrhea. Now when they get diarrhea they lose moisture too quickly and because the first rains weren't enough to fill all the pans they couldn't get to water in time and so a lot of them died from that diarrhea. And so we had a really big die off of buffalo at that time um, and they were the ones that were affected mostly. But you will also have found that um, kudu would have been affected, they are often ones that are affected by drought. Hippos were badly affected um, and then some of your smaller antelope as well. But isn't that incredible? You can actually see even bits of the fur from this buffalo there as well. So generally at carcasses you would never find any of this stuff and that makes it so interesting. You know here we have really good cleanup crews. Our hyenas and our vultures normally get to all of this stuff long before we ever get to see it. But there's still some hair and it just shows you how difficult hair is actually to break down. Um, you would think that if all the meat is gone from this animal and you can see the bones are almost clean that the hair would be gone as well. But not so. Hair is very 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 tough to break down and so there's only a few animals that can do it. And you find when lions and leopard when they eat carcasses and they do consume hair, it actually comes out just the way it went in. It's very, very um, difficult to digest. And so the only thing that really can get through this is hyenas, which is pretty amazing. Well, that was very, very cool. Very, very nice find. We're going to carry on. We're going to go back to Jamie, who I believe is back on Juma. Oh, While well, Tristan carries on with his walk, we've come all the way back from Cheetah Plains and we are back once again at the hyena den and I'm going in really, really, really slowly to see whether or not we've got a chance of having a slightly closer relationship with these two cubs that are in here. And of course, I want to see if Gwen has come back to them 
they did see a hyena coming in this direction this morning and she moved through Chitwa so I'm hoping that that might be Gwen and that she might have come back because as soon as we get her here we can start this process properly I'm just going really really slowly I'm trying to keep the vehicle acceleration to an absolute minimum so that it's just the engine idling gently in I don't see anything now the cubs are old enough that they could spend quite a bit of time outside of the den itself possibly sleeping in the drainage line around here or the river system that's around here it's quite a thick area so it's the perfect place for them to hide don't see anything let's see if Gwen's come back oh slippery rocks that's not a very subtle approach slightly confused by the fact that they've gone running out of the den when we've arrived rather than staying in tucked away in the den and the only thing I could think of was that perhaps they this this old den site has collapsed slightly and perhaps they don't have enough room to get right in because they, they're much much larger they're not tiny newborn cubs so perhaps they don't feel safe at the depth that they're in I can't see anything in that entrance can you doesn't look like it no oh well we tried we'll try again tomorrow or this afternoon actually and try again this afternoon oh. BAS Tig you want to know well if Gwen is a low ranking female how would a low ranking female go about attracting a mate and I'm sorry I'm speaking softly just in case they are around here we don't want to come in yelling away well, fortunately, as far as I know, because of course all males are submissive to the females, attracting a mate is not too much of a problem. As soon as a low-ranking female comes into estrus, uh, the males will start showing interest in her. And there's always several clan males, so if she happens to be in, in estrus as the same, at the same time as a high-ranking female, uh, the males might consort with a high-ranking female but there's always going to be one that doesn't get lucky and therefore will spend time mate potentially mating with her and of course bear in mind that some of the clan males are related to some of the females which means that they won't that nature will try and create a way of avoiding inbreeding I don't see any sign of the little ones I guess Gwen didn't come back or if she did she came and collected them and put them to bed all right worth a try. It's a nice den site here. Nice and quiet. Very well. The entrance is quite well hidden. I'm sure there's other entrances on the other side as well. They're usually connected. They usually have several escape tunnels that they can use or different entrances. <laughs> you can just sit here and go <coughs> but that's not going to work. Alright. Okay hyena cubs. We'll see you again later believe it or not we're not a threat I promise you we'll be entertaining for you when you come to be comfortable with us hyena cubs are the best and they come up and sniff your tires sniff the rubber go and chew on your hubcaps and we try and stop them from doing that I once even had I was busy talking to the guests that I had at the time and I heard this crunching sound and I looked around and a hyena had grabbed my wing mirror which is not what we want to do well not what we want them to uh, want to allow them to do but sometimes it's a bit tricky you need eyes in the back of your head at an active hyena den which is what I'm looking forward to we'll get there oh, it seems as though Tristan's on a roll this morning and he's found you something very pretty We have found something very pretty which has now just proceeded to take off. Hopefully it will land for us again. It's in a little Lacrea butterfly um, and they are quite common here. We've seen quite a few of them this morning but they are quite difficult to actually get on camera. Um, now that it's warming up a little bit most of the butterflies are quite fidgety and so they're moving around all over the place and it's very difficult to actually get them on camera. Um, 
Now, I'm not sure, Jandre, did you hear that? Was it a scopsal? It sounded like a little scopsal just called behind us. That's quite unusual. Generally, they only call in the evenings or very early morning. But I think the butterfly has landed. Jandre, oh. We've just chased it off. I'm sorry, guys. Heavy footed this morning, not good. Um, so, unfortunately, it's flown away, but there are lots of them about and they are moving around all over the place. But it's been a really great morning for butterflies. We've actually seen so many, it's been really, really nice. Um, but, like I say, they're just tough to get onto camera. They tend to flutter about all over the place and don't sit still for very long periods of time, which is not ideal. You need to find them on a food source for them to, to sit nicely. Um, but the insect life at the moment is pretty incredible as Jamie was just saying that we seem to be on a roll this morning and it has been really interesting as we've walked we've just bumped into little insects all over the place it's been really great to see um, so much life it's been such a tough last few years with insects um, in the last sort of two years there's been so little that we've actually seen um, in the summer months because of the lack of rain that this year it's kind of feels like there's an explosion of them I'm sure it's just normal for a, a summer month when we get a lot of rain but at the moment it just feels like there's so many more than normal and I'm sure it's because of those two years of kind of dry period of no insects and very little rain but um, it's uh, like I say really interesting for us as well to see them and what we have noticed as well is a lot of little insects that you we haven't ID'd before this is often what happens it's the same as birds is you get dry periods and then you'll get a rain and you'll get birds and, and insects that go out of their normal distribution because as they follow the rains along they end up in places that they normally wouldn't be also the dry periods would have brought in birds that typically like drier conditions and so they would have spent time in areas that they normally wouldn't have so it's been really good for the, in that regard we've seen a lot of interesting different species in the last few months so we just kind of coming slowly back down towards Juma Dam we're coming just to see if there's any sign of anything there's been no further alarm calls there's been the monkeys all quiet so it's not really showing any signs of anything and like I say we've scoured this area completely we've done a big loop around checking for any tracks and there's some baboons calling at the moment I think they're in the lodge itself so they're probably causing a bit of havoc baboons love to go into the lodge and they know that this time of the day that it's generally breakfast time and so they'll go to the lodge and go scrounge around and see if there's any little bits of breakfast that they can maybe hunt down and, and get for themselves they obviously are very opportunistic animals so as they go along they know that the lodges generally provide an easy source of food so going into a lodge is much easier than going out here and scratching around um, for food. Also the thing is at a lodge is it's generally a lot safer. Um, um, they uh, end up going into these lodges and they know that the predators don't spend nearly as much time in there as they would out in the bush. So for a baboon it's really a great place. Also in lodges, most of the lodges have thatch roofs. Now thatch is a great place for insects to hide. So you'll find lots of little beetles that will be inside there. And so the baboons go into the thatch and they dig around inside there looking for those beetles. So they can be a little bit of a menace with that. Um, thatching is is not easy to do. And so when you end up with baboons pulling it all out, it could be a bit of a frustration. I'm just trying to look around to see if there's any other signs of anything that could be of interest. Um, there are a few butterflies, like I say, flying around, but quite difficult. None of them are really settling down too much. So I'm just going to see what else we can find. We're just going to cross over the road quickly and down towards the dam. Still battling a little bit with the birds this morning. We haven't seen too many that are in camera shot. So I can't let Brent get ahead too much. Oh, have you got a butterfly, John? Very nice. Uh, little spotted joker that we've got there. It's a really nice name. I like the name for them. And you can see it's just sitting very nicely with its wings open. And that's how we know it's a butterfly and not a moth. Generally with moths, you'll find that they'll lie with their wings kind of back and flattened. And this one is probably drying out a little bit after um, a sort of moist morning um, and so you'll find that they'll spread their wings a little bit to dry but generally its wings will come up and stay flattened whereas a moth will have very flattened wings like it is now. Um, these spotted jokers you can see where they get their name from they've got those little brown markings all over them that look like little spots so very very pretty little butterflies. They're being very kind to us as well generally they are quite 
mobile butterflies. We've actually been trying to get them on camera all morning and they keep moving everywhere. Um, but this guy's decided just to sit and spend some time with us, which is really quite nice. Alright, so while we admire this little joker, we're going to go across to Jamie, who I believe has got a water buck. I hear that Tristan's been talking about the sort of the changes that we've seen with the drought and then now with the plenty of rain. And it makes it appropriate time to chat about what I've been thinking about over the last few days. Now this is last year's crop of baby waterbuck that are now nearly a year old and looking particularly good. Hey gorgeous girl. Yes, we're talking about you. Remember how last year, this time last year, we were following kudu around, waiting to see their calves. We saw little baby fluffy waterbuck absolutely everywhere. It just hasn't felt like that this year. We haven't seen, I mean, we've seen lots of baby impala. They've been around. But we, we just haven't seen the, the baby larger antelope. We've seen a few baby inyala, a few, but I've, I haven't seen one little kudu. And I have not seen one small waterbuck. I haven't seen one young waterbuck which I find quite astounding. And of course I haven't seen one buffalo baby either, but then to be fair I haven't seen a single buffalo in a very long time. Or at least a buffalo breeding herd. And it's just interesting the way that the dynamics of the drought and the impala managed to weather it relatively well. They still had their babies, but I suppose when you're a smaller antelope it's slightly easier. They don't need as much in the way of resources, but for our larger antelope it obviously hit them particularly hard. You can see this one started growing his horns, not quite at the giant stage just yet. He's got a few years of growing to do, but a really nice collection of, collection? <laughs> really nice herd of young waterbuck. I've just seen, the reason I got distracted there is I just saw a bird fly past. I want to see if I can catch up with it. It was beautifully illuminated in the sun. It was a Jacobin cuckoo. But the Jacobin cuckoo has vanished. It was sitting so beautifully on the branch. Alright, well, on that note, it is the end of our sunrise safari. So a big thank you to Viam, as always, for his wonderful camera work. And a big thank you to all of you for joining us. We'll catch you on the sunset safari. Don't forget about our fireside chat tonight. Bye-bye, everybody. I'll send you across to James for the last few minutes. There, the perfect way to end our lazy morning with two lazy beefaloes. Just gently chewing the cud, their morning breakfast, regurgitated and re-eaten now. Talking about better times when they moved with the herds. When the ladies thought that they were young and virile, as opposed to old and decrepit, which they are now. They look so depressed, don't they? In the background, a wood sandpiper and a, an Egyptian goose pair. Typically unsuccessful parents. And Rebecca reckons that these buffalo don't look depressed at all. They look like happy besties. Rebecca, that is because you are a generally cheery person and I'm a miserable git. But I must say, as the sun comes out on them, there is a certain element of cheerfulness, I suppose. And there are the geese having a little bath. It's such a lovely, peaceful scene, this. Kingfishers and starlings calling above us. Butterflies flying around. Very pleasant. Now, I'm sure Jamie gave you the update, but one of the uh, birthday children has been found on Hoffman's, so unfortunately we can't go and see the birthday kids today. Maybe they'll come back this afternoon. I think it's unlikely, however. Shall we move on from our beefies? No? Oh. 
Um, Kathy, you want to know if our fireside chat will be on this stream or if it's going to go on to some other platform? No, it will be on the stream. Don't worry, it will be on the normal wildsafarilive.com or if you're watching on YouTube on that too. So you don't need to change anything, you don't need to find Facebook, you don't need to go to Periscope or to um, what else do we broadcast on that? Uh, Africa Geographic sometimes uses us. Yeah, no, you just stay exactly where you are and it will just smoothly cut, hopefully, from a vehicle to the fireside chat. And for 15 minutes we'll have a chat about our highlights. And I tell you what, I mean, for those of you who are going to be up, I know some of you only watch one drive a day or parts of one drive a day, it would be very nice to know what um, your impressions are. Send us a couple of your highlights, perhaps, of those two cubs before we go to the fireside chat so that we have a chance to actually address those uh, interesting and wonderful memories with you. Now I must tell you that Craig the Batman is starting to look a little hungry so we're going to head home towards breakfast now. I don't know what breakfast is going to be but I'm sure it will be delicious. Amanda is a very good cook. And so it remains for me to say thank you to all of you for coming on our drive today, for asking us questions. Thank you very much indeed for your comments and we will of course see you later at about four o'clock this afternoon. And don't forget the fireside chat at a quarter to seven to celebrate the birthday of Shongile and Hosanna. Until then, bye-bye.